NXT Championship. So very successful there. Played for, what was the name of the coach? Skip Burtman. Yeah, legendary baseball coach. So he had great coaching. So he has that background as a player and had a great coach. Since 2019 to present, he, his players on the PGA Tour and Corn Ferry Tour have amassed over $17 million in earnings. He's had two players shoot 59, one in a junior event, and he also has a player that shot 58 in a Corn Ferry event. Uh, currently coaches Billy Horschel, Sam Burns, who just won uh, last week, Hudson Swafford, and John Rahm, and uh, also works with something very near and dear to my heart, the Alabama football team. <laughs> and they have won national championships 2016, 2018, 2020. So we're going to try to break the, strat, the trend. I think so. One more this Get year. two in a row. Get to 21. He has uh, written four books The Mindset Manifesto, The Urgency to Create a Competitive Mindset, The Game Plan Workbook, and his current book, which is kind of interesting title <laughs> Break Free from Suckville. So that comes out what? Uh, next, next Monday. Next Monday. So you'll be able to get that book. He also has a podcast called Secrets to Winning. So from Birmingham, Alabama, welcome Dr. Brett McCabe. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I should know this stuff by heart, but I don't. So our host, uh, Billy Horschel, who's uh, responsible along with the AJGA and many sponsors for putting this event on for you today. So um, Billy's given a lot back to golf. Um, not only with uh, to junior golf, but he's doing some other things and very involved in a lot of di different charity events. And uh, so it's cool to see someone have success and give back, and Billy's certainly doing that. Um, Six-time winner on the PGA Tour, had two wins this year, won the WGC World Match Play and the BMW Championship on the European Tour. He was a four-time All-American at the University of Florida, three times first team, 06, 07, in 09, and then 08, he slipped to second team. I know that's still a thorn in your side, too. You can't <laughs> hear mad about that. He was a member of the 2007 Walker Cup team and 2007 and 8 Arnold Palmer Cup teams. 2014 FedEx Cup champion, and currently ranked 18th in the world golf rankings. So, uh, our host, Billy Horschel, thanks for being here today. So, how many of you were at this event and uh, attended this clinic last time. Anybody? That's good. So we can do the same thing we did last time. <laughs> um, basically, we've done this several different ways. Billy and I have done it every year um, since he started this event. But we did this same format in, t not last year, but the year before. And it's just kind of an open forum. You know, we'll, I'll kind of open it up and get these guys to share a few things and then we're gonna basically open it up to questions. So any of you that are participants in the event that have questions about anything to do with coaching, uh, sports psychology, playing, you can uh, fire away. We'll do our best to answer your question. Any parents that have any things they wanna ask, we encourage that as well. Uh, we just wanna make this a very uh, fun, enjoyable experience. Hopefully you'll learn something that you can apply to your games and. Uh, make yourselves better players and parents hopefully you'll learn some things that'll help you uh encourage them to to reach some of their their goals as players so let's talk a little bit about brett your background as a as a player as a pitcher and how you use that to uh to help p players compete competitively in, in golf i think it, it gives me a little bit of an advantage i've played golf since i was a kid but you know i, I went to the baseball route and when you're a pitcher very rarely do you ever have your best stuff. And I think what's important to understand is most of the time pitchers, and I was a reliever, so I'd pitch at warm up every day to go in a game. And when you went in the game, you never really knew what you had. And you have the long run in from the bullpen and you get out there and no one really cares what you have. The coach doesn't say, do you have your good stuff or you're gonna stay in the game? What you have to do is get the guys out. And I think from a golfing standpoint, what I want my players to do and Billy is to do their work off the course, but then be willing to apply their tools on the course. Not think that what they did at home is gonna automatically transfer and have their great stuff every day. And one of the things that Billy has done extraordinarily well this year is he's won with your B game. You stayed around long enough and got your A plus game, probably a BMW near the end, maybe. It was pretty good. 
plus. He will he'll plus never admit. Never, 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 never plus. Admit. But it was really good. It was good, yes. Yes. <laughs> but what you have to understand is, as a pitcher, it's about the competitive aspect of it. Because you guys have to stay in it long enough to get on a run. And it's never about having your good stuff. It's never about having your A-plus stuff all the time. And I think, as a pitcher, that competitive side of never expecting to have your great stuff. In fact, as pitchers will tell you, you don't want your best stuff. Because that's usually where you lose your discipline. So it's about being disciplined, having a plan, and then knowing how to analyze what you did after the game. Where I think a lot of things in golf we can get a lot better at is, if I ask you how you play, the easy answer is, ah, not that good. Now you probably did something really well out there, and you may have competed with your C game, but that's a win. You know, you may not win, but that's a win for you. And it's learning how to take the best out of what you have each day and find what you have as your best. Also, you don't really care about how you look doing it. It's just yep. about getting people out and throwing strikes. And Correct. I think a lot of times we fall in love with think, trying to make our swings look perfect and all that. And in golf, it's about getting the ball in the hole and shooting the lowest score you can. And it may not look pretty, and there's a lot of ways to get it done. Just like in baseball, you may you may get people grounding out, you may strike people out, you just got to find a way to get them out. And so I think that's something else that you've talked about a lot is yeah. that it doesn't have to look good, it just got to get the results. Just get it done. And I think one of the best things that you guys can do is learn how to accept what you have that day versus automatically starting to search for how to refine what you were doing on the range two days ago. Like, what do I have today? If you do the work consistently, you work with your coach, you're out there working, it shouldn't vary all that much. And so you should know where to go. But can you play with your B game? Can you compete with your C game? Because if you can only compete with your A game, we got problems. So we got to get better at dealing with those other days. And it's not vanity and it's not proof. It's not validation. If at the end of the day, you get it in the house and you got two bloody nose and a swollen eye, but you're standing on top, that's a victory. And I think golfers sometimes get so caught up in, well, it wasn't as pretty as it should have been. I was hitting it a little thin. The putts weren't coming off right. I was misreading. It doesn't matter. Like, let that go. It's not about perfect. So, Billy, um, a lot of people think you just came right out of the womb a great player. <laughs> <laughs> but you had how many scholarship offers when you got out of high school? Um, two. Uh, one. The first one was to community college where I grew up in um, Bavard, so Bavard Community College. And then I got offered um, December or November, December of my senior year by University of Florida. Um, it was a book scholarship and those are the only two offers that, uh, that I got. So you went from a book scholarship yep. out of high school to being a first team All-American as a freshman, mm -hmm. first team All-American as a sophomore. We'll skip your junior year. Good point. First team All-American your senior year. What helped you transform from, honestly, just being a... Average junior. Average junior to a three-time first team All-American. There's only been, what, two or three that have been four I think, times? I think there's five. I think five. Um, so it was sort of a little disappointment in my junior year. Um, but that was a learning experience. There were things I didn't do uh, that junior year. That I did my freshman and sophomore year um, that I re-implemented in my senior year. So um, the, the, the key factor in that, I mean, there's many key factors, but I got blessed to go to a college that had a college golf coach um, and Buddy Alexander. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys may not know him. Buddy Alexander was a golf coach there at University of Florida um, 20, almost 30 years before that. He was at LSU. Um, coached at Georgia Southern, played at Georgia Southern, won the 86 U.S. Amateur, played on a few Walk Cup teams. So I got blessed to go to a coach that was a really good player. Um, he tried to play professionally, got his amateur career back, and that's when he won 86 U.S. Am. Um, so what I what I had already was I had a work ethic um, that was close, if not unmatched. To, to many of the guys on the team and to many of the juniors around me. Um, I had a, a belief in, you know, let's just say, a, you know, at that age, a, a cockiness that I was, I was good and I was better than everyone else, or I should be better than everyone else, even though my results didn't show it. Um, and I just, I wasn't going to, you know, take no for an answer. I was gonna find some way to achieve what my ultimate dream was, was to play was 
at an early age to be a professional athlete. And then when I went down to, you know, decided golf was my path, that I wanted to be a professional golfer. Um, and so I went into, and the other thing I was willing to do is I was, in, I was willing to listen and take advice and, and to really work on what someone was trying to get me to do. Um, if I, you know, cause I believed and trusted in Buddy that he had my best interest in, in mind. And so from there, he taught me how to play the game of golf. And what I mean by that is he didn't teach me golf swing. Yes, he taught me a little bit, but he taught me how to hit some golf shots. He taught me how to, to manage my game. He taught me how to get around the golf course when I wasn't um, playing great. He taught me how to prepare for tournaments. He taught me how to, you know, when I play in practice rounds, what to look for uh, and sense of pin locations, where you want to miss it, you know, trying to understand what the conditions of, of that turn or what each con what the conditions of each round may be you know right now we got a north wind you know roughly and so maybe tomorrow the wind's going to come out of the southwest so maybe on the first hole out here obviously it's downwind then it's going to come in off the left and off the right a little bit so prepare that way um you know in the sense of how to maybe change up your game plan or what the hole may play like so i taught i got taught a ton of information um, all through my four years, but especially in that first semester, that first year at University of Florida, that allowed me to, um, you know, have an unbelievable freshman year and sort of put me on an unbelievable path to, to sit where I am now. Let's talk a little bit about the way things that are changing on the tour right now since you've started. I know since I've been out there a lot longer than you have, but it's, I don't know what to say ages, but if you look at how things are, are changing, on the PGA Tour, um, you have a team that you've surrounded yourself with. You know, I'm, I do your full swing, short game putting. Brett does the mental side of the game. You got a, a statistician, Mark Horton, who does the stats. Caddy, Sherry handles all your business things. Um, and a lot of players even have more people on their team than that. Talk a little bit about the team aspect of of your um, golf career and. Kind of what everybody's role is and and how you manage that you know I, i'm a i'm a believer in in surrounding yourself with people that believe in you want to help you and have the best interest out for yourself there's a lot of people in this world that want to try and make it on their own and they've been successful but at the end of the day i feel like the people that go the farthest are the people who have people around them to give them great advice and sometimes the advice i get is not the advice i want to hear right then and there and I may not agree with it, and I'm sh and I know for a fact I've done it with him. I've done it with him. I've done it with everyone on my team. I've sort of put you know the hand up and said I don't want to listen to it right now, uh, but they know I need to hear it, and they know that knowing me that I'm going to come around to to um, listening to what they're trying to tell me. Um, hopefully, it's sooner than than later, um, but. I'm blessed that I've worked with this guy for 13 years and he's my coach and he's my teacher, but he's a, my friend. He's one of my best friends. He's my mentor, one of my mentors, and, and he's given me great advice on the golf course and in life. And I've been blessed to be with him now for, we won in 2017, 2017. It was 2018 we started. Yeah, that's right. 2018. You won at uh, Zurich, Zurich. A month later. So yeah, yeah 2018. Yeah. Um, I've got a stats guy that's been with since 2014. I've got a caddy. Well, that's it. Caddy's been a little bit of a revolving door, but we've got a caddy now. We got the we got a caddy now who plant who who I think is pretty much uh, set in stone. But I'm always looking at my game and I'm always looking at myself as a person of what am I missing? What what can I bring into my team that could add value and that could possibly make me a better player? Um, the thing I'm one thing I'm not afraid of, where I think other tour pros are, is that they're afraid to take risk. They're afraid to maybe try something that, you know, may not work right away. It's funny because nowadays everyone's so easy to change swing coaches and teachers because they think that's the big issue. But at the end of the day, that probably isn't the issue. It's probably um, the way they practice, the way they prepare, the way they prep. Maybe the caddy they have on the bag's not doing, you know. Maybe he's not doing his job in keeping the player in, in a focused mindset and to prepare each week and, and certain things on the golf course. Maybe it's his trainer's not, you know, 
the way he's training isn't correct, or maybe a sports psychologist, or you know, there's there's so many other factors. But everyone wants to change swing coaches nowadays so quickly, and it's hardly ever the swing. Let me tell you that. Uh, but the way I, like I said, the way I looked at it is I'm trying to bring value, and if I think someone can bring value, I'm going to bring them in on my team. And if if it, if after a period of time that value didn't materialize, then you know then we go down another path. But I'm, I'm willing to take that risk if I feel like I'm going to get better by going down this path um, because that's just so hard. Once you get to a certain level, it's hard to make continual, it's hard to keep getting better. It's easier at a junior age right now to where you guys are. You're going to have, you have so much room of growth. But when you get to my level and you get to how long I've been doing it, that, that, that space up there at the top is razor thin. And so you got to find little bits and pieces that keep moving up and, and and, and uh, fulfilling that tank of, of potential. Uh, one thing I would add with Billy with regards to the team is Billy's willing to listen and learn. He may not always agree with it, but he'll put it back there and think about it. And one of the things that I would encourage you guys to do is it's so easy to compare yourselves to people that you're with on the range and really like what somebody does. And we all care what people think, right? I, I, people always say, God, I wish I didn't care. If you didn't care, there'd be something wrong with you. But we all care. But what you have to do is say, what can I learn from them? You know, when we watch these guys on TV, we're watching the best players at the best run they're having. PJ Tour players win 80% of their income in a year in five events, five to six events. My goal with these guys is to win a lot more money in those other events. So he's willing to learn. He's willing to listen, to watch somebody else and say, ooh, it's not that I want to do what they're doing, but what is it that I can learn from a book I've read, a movie, you know, watching other sports what is it that I can learn to apply to my program and so he's not always out there trying to change what he's trying to do is grow and what I'd encourage you guys to do is is say okay how do I grow my game and become a better professional because when you go to the college ranks you are a professional at that point you're doing this as a job you're doing this as something that you're chasing and that's a great opportunity but what can you do to learn I had a kid in my office the other day at Bama not football don't worry T.A. but he was a junior all-american and he said, he says, and he goes, Doc, I, I, I got a problem. I said, yeah, what's your problem? Goes, I was a national champion as a junior. I'm the fifth ranked person on my team in my event right now. What happened? I said, well, these guys have been doing it a lot longer. I said, you're 18 jumping against guys that are 23. And they know how to do it better. You, you may be more talented. They know how to do it. You look at somebody like Billy, he knows how to be a pro. And what's interesting is one of the things that I've watched with him for three or four years is Young guys will come up to him and say, hey, what do I have to do? But then they don't follow it. And they're gone. This guy knows what he's doing. He's won multiple, multiple times across the world in the biggest stages. Listen to him. There's a certain discipline and structure that he's learned by watching and observing the best. It's not just about, oh, I need to hurry up and chase and change a new swing coach. No, I need to do my stuff better. That's the greatest gift that you guys can learn from watching the best. I think I think he said something, and I've, I've never publicly said it. I've said it to this person and maybe a couple people around. Um, but I did watch people when I came out on tour, and I, I watched what they did. And, and one guy I, I, I thought had a great plan and did it, the, did, did it the right way, and he was successful, and he achieved what he wanted to achieve, and he still hasn't achieved fully what he wanted. But Justin Rose, while he went about you know bringing people into his team you know, wanting to get big, uh, better, wanting to get longer. Like him and his swing coach, Sean Foley, wanted to attain this of uh, being able to hit 300 yards in the air. Plus, because they knew they were able to do that, the how much that added value to the game of golf and made him a better player, anybody a better player on the PJ Tour, really. But um, it really took your game to a next level. But I think I looked at him, I loved how... He was so much into the process of trying to get better, bring the people in, the right people in that were going to help that. And yes, sometimes the results weren't uh, always there, but he wasn't. But he stuck with what he did. He stuck with his process. He believed with what he, what him and his team were doing was going to, you know, come to fruition. And then, you know, he he got the number one in the world, won the FedEx Cup. Uh, you know, he's had chances to win majors, and he just, you know. Masters had a chance to win the Masters That's with Sergio Garcia and just got nipped. So, you know, I think I, I love looking at R Rose has always been someone I've, you know, looked up to on tour in the sense of the way he's gone about, uh, you know, diligently trying to attack his game to get better. 
and it, it's pretty special to see and, and that's where I've sort of you know had the idea of let's let's bring some more people into the team that could add value and let's really get into what our process is and we've always done it but we've really you know with a full team now done it in the sense of with the fitness and the, the mental and the physical and the stuff on the golf course and just you know stick to what we're trying to do and believe that what we're doing and it was the right stuff and it's going to turn into results and yes we want the results to happen right away and sometimes we get frustrated and i get frustrated still to this day that i'm not getting the full results out of everything but when i look back at it i know when i evaluate everything we're going about it the right way and it's just a matter of time until we're rewarded for all the hard work so patience is important i mean everybody wants it yesterday and if you look at the best players in the world, who's the number one player in the world? John Rahm. You work with John Rahm. How many swing coaches has he had in his career? Uh, he has uh, one back in Spain that he is kind of his swing coach and kind of his mental coach, and then Dave Phillips over here that he's known forever. Okay. So, so I would say one combined between the two. Yeah. Who's number two in the world? Dustin. Oh, Dustin. Dustin's had, two, he's had work with his college coach, and That's then he yes, went to Butch. Still has him, still has him yeah. yeah. so he's got basically two. two. I mean, Warren yeah. Cow has had the same coach since he was this high. So, Justin shoot. Thomas's dad's taught him since this high. Rory. Rory just, sw just switched coaches, but he had the same coach forever. You look at the top players, they don't change. <clears throat> they, have, they have the same people around them. Why do you think that's important? It's a continuity. You're building a foundation. You're building a relationship. There's so much more to it than just having somebody look at your swing. You have to build something that'll hold up under pressure. And you know that's one of the things with Billy is he's every year hasn't been great, but he's patient. He knows we keep working hard. We move the right direction. He's not looking to go see somebody else. And I think that's the biggest change I see with this next generation of players that, that come out. They want it now. If it's not working now, they're going to go to someone else. And if you look at the data and the statistics, when somebody changes swing coaches, normally there's a little bit of a bump right at the start, and then it kind of levels out or it falls backwards. So why not just stay with the same person? If you're leveling out or falling back a little bit, you, at least you have some continuity there as opposed to jumping around and going to see somebody else where you're learning something totally different. Because I've been teaching golf since 1984, most people have certain tendencies in their swing. You have a certain fingerprint, so to speak, with your swing. And it's about understanding that and knowing how to make the adjustments within that. And I was just working with someone who played in the tournament who didn't wasn't happy with the way they played. There's a couple of things in their swing that we've talked about. And when he does them well, he plays well. When he doesn't do them well, he doesn't play well. It's not anything new or different. It's about managing those things and keeping those things in check. So hopefully, through your swing coaches and the people you work with, you have a good understanding of, okay, when I'm playing well, these are the things I do and these are the things I focus on. When I'm not playing well, here's where it goes off. And, and get to where you own your swing. And one thing about Billy, we work a lot, but he, he understands his swing. He understands what he needs to do. He understands how to make adjustments. And part of my job is to get him to understand that because if he's on the tournament somewhere halfway across the world, he's got to have enough knowledge to know what adjustments he needs to make to try to get back on track. So don't put, I mean, it's great to have people on your team, but you still need to own what you're doing. You still need to have an understanding. It's not, don't put all your future in somebody else's hands. Yeah, you want them to be there for you. You want to have them in your back pocket, but at the same time, you have to take ownership of what you're doing and understand what you need to do to be successful and be able to make the adjustments so that when you have, you don't have your A game, you know how to go to the B or C game, as Brett talks about, and, and get get it around and still shoot a good score. And that's, I think, what the best players in the world do. I mean, I've watched Rory win golf tournaments, hitting it all over the map, but he just manages it around and figures out how to shoot a good score, and he's good enough to where he can do it. So, you know, get some continuity in what you're doing. Get some continuity with the people that you surround yourself with. Put together a plan and stick with it. Give it time. And, and, and I'll argue with that, too. How many of y'all have a journal? Yeah. How many of y'all use it? Okay, why not? Like, after every day, I sell one through my office, but you don't have to do anything special with it. You can get a notebook. And where are the guys that I work with who didn't raise their hand? All right, you guys better have your journals moving. But the, the, the truth is, when you leave every day, your emotions are going to tell you if you played well or not. But that's not always true. 
But if you look back at your journal and you're like, man, this time last year, this time three months ago, I was really, like, I'm actually a lot better because you've got to write stuff down. You go see your swing coach and you don't write it down. What do you remember? Like there should be your book in there and that stays with you everywhere you go. And nobody likes to journal. You don't have to be dear diary, but just keep your notes, like write down what you did today and, and things like that, that helps. I, I, I can't agree more. I mean, I was n I'm never, I'm not a guy that writes goals down on a piece of paper. I'm not guys, I'm not a person who writes certain things down, but, and am I as diligent as I should be with it? No, but there are times when I am sort of struggling a little bit on, on the course a little bit. And so I'll just start writing notes down, things I've been doing, things I'm feeling, things Todd and I are talking about in the swing, things that, you know, maybe that I did something good on the golf course, or I may have done something bad in the golf course. And it just sort of like helps me get it out of my head and on a piece of paper. And then I can always review that if I need to later later on. But um, like I said, I, I haven't done it in eight months. I did it, I did it, it was really good at the beginning of the year. And I haven't done it so much, but like I said, it's. I, I, when I do need it. I was kind of talking about you too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Just because you won twice this year doesn't mean you can stop I know, doing I know. stuff. <laughs> but I mean, it helps to just write things down. It, it's, it's really a vital key. And, um, you know, as I said, it gets things out of my head and puts on a piece of paper. And I feel like when it's, once out of my head, I, not that I don't think about it again, but there's less chances of me thinking about it. And that goes to, you know, someone's asked me when I work with Brett, this couple of years ago, like, what is it that you guys work on, and what is it that he does so well? And I'm like, I'm like, what are we working on? I couldn't tell you. Um, and that's not saying that I'm not paying attention to what he's doing, but what I need him for is different than what you all may need a sports psychologist for. Like, I just need him to be there for me to talk about things, whether it's on or off the golf course. A lot of it comes down to me never feeling like I've done enough work, like I haven't worked hard enough which is never the case, but um, I feel like I need to, you know, maybe the reassurance or just him telling me a few things. And then once I get on the golf course, like I don't think about it, it's gone, it's out of my head, like I've, I'm freed up again. Um, but, you know, I don't, you know, we, I don't think we've ever we talked about, yeah, we, yeah. I mean, we never talked about like on the golf course, the emotions I feel over a seven iron, like that's, that's something I've always done very well. And it's sort of just maybe born with it that way a little bit, but, you know, there's just certain things when I look at myself, sometimes I don't feel like I've, you know, done enough or I'm not adequate enough to, to do, you know, play well, the level I am. One of the I things with your awareness you're really good about though is there's some weeks you're pretty target focused and there's some weeks you're very swing focused. Yeah. But I let him do that. One is because he's great at what he does, but also he's very clear on what he's saying. Like this week, I got a really good feel for me and TA and I want to stick with that. I'm like, sounds great to me. Like, who am I to disagree with? But it's organized. And so one of the things that I believe in because of the journaling and training your pra and planning your practice out so when you leave every day, it's done, it's fixed, it's, you feel good when you get back home and you know you, you had a good day's work, is when you go out and to compete, you're not validating your training. You're taking those tools and applying them to chaos. Like, that's a chaotic environment. You have no idea how you're going to play. And I hear a lot of times from players that are saying like, oh, you know, it just wasn't my best. The reason I named the book Break Free from Suckville, Suckville is the space between your potential and your reality. And you always think you suck. When in fact, your reality is really, really good. So let's get rid of that potential and find and be organized to get the most out of your reality every day. And when you're organized like Billy is, it's easy. I mean, there's some weeks I may not say much to you. And I'll sit and watch him and TA work because I'm interested and I'm looking at clues. But we may make a comment and say, look, just this week, all I want you to do, there's one thing I want you to do, and that's it. It doesn't need to be an hour session. And that's how like a journal can help you and have an organization. You guys need to take that ownership. Questions, we need some questions? Yeah, let me just say one thing. Um, I, 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 I think I've said this every year to, to juniors here that play, um, but you guys are in a position now that Hopefully you all are going to get college scholarships and you all go to where you want. But I think, you know, there's two things I want to tell you. When you go to college, there's three things that everyone, you know, especially being an athlete, that everyone wants to do. Or there's three things you can do in college. You got your academics, you got your athletics, and you got your social scene. You know, going out, hanging out, you know, that, that environment. Um, 
unfortunately, you can only do two of those things really well in college. You can do three things very average, or you can do two things very well. You know, if you're going to be able, if you're going to give you opportunity to play on your, your golf team, then you need to make sure your academics are in check and, and you're doing well in the classroom. Um, and then if you want to make team and travel and play, then you gotta, you got to practice and you got to make sure your golf side of it is taken care of. I'm not saying don't have fun in college and don't enjoy it because it's the greatest four years of my life and sometimes I wish to go back to college when, I'm, when, when things on tour you know, aren't great. Um, I wish to just go back to college and enjoy the college lifestyle, but there's a right time and there's a wrong time to enjoy the college lifestyle. So I just want to make sure that you guys figure out that for you. And the kids that I've seen go to college um, that have a lot of potential and have that opportunity to probably play at the next level, they get caught up in doing things that sort of takes away from what their goal is. And if their goal is to play professional golf, then you need to make sure you're doing whatever you can to to um, to achieve that green dream. And that means sacrificing things. And that and there's sacrifices that you have to make in life um, now, later on as as uh, adults as parents uh, so you know the, er the earlier um, that you all can learn the sacrifices that have to be made to achieve you know the dreams that you guys want then the better off um, and the other thing too is with that I hope every one of you all make it to the LPGA and PGA Tour that's the goal of yours but the great thing about this game of golf that I'm um, hopefully you all realize now I know your parents do is that this can open many doors uh, outside the golf world if you do it the right way when you meet people um, on the golf course or playing junior AMs or you play in college AMs or you make it to the next level, even in pro AMs, make sure you, you are respectful, you give them the time of day, you are really having an enjoyable day out there on the golf course and, and write thank you notes and maybe create a connection that you just never know how that person can influence your life. And, you know, if golf isn't the way for you, this person could help you, you know, get your, get a job in the financial world or start out wherever you want to, you know, maybe they don't know, maybe personally they can't help you, but they know someone else that can. And they'd be willing to, you know, put their neck out on the line to reach out to this person to give you an opportunity where you want to start. So uh, if you handle yourself the right way, you're going to be successful in life. And I know majority, I think all y'all are, um, but you just got to make sure you're doing it and handle it the right way to, to give yourself y'all uh, the opportunity and ability. Can I, can I add one thing on that? Yeah. Um, parents, one thing I want you guys to realize is that this game is really, really hard and it's really challenging. Um, you know, when if Billy has a great day or has a day that he grind, you probably don't hear from us right away, do you? I mean, you kind of take care of yourself. You may call TA or you may call me, but we let you kind of handle it. Yeah. Yeah. Let your kids handle it. Okay. There's a couple things that I would suggest. Give them a couple hours to decompress. Because if you just came in from a hard day work and you've been in the traffic all day and somebody asks you what decision you made at nine o'clock in the morning, that's the last thing you wanna think about. Give them time after a round to decompress. I know you have the answers because I've, both of my daughters played golf and I was a genius outside the ropes. <laughs> but, and my kids would say, dad, you don't do what you teach. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm leaving to go out of town. So it just, it's really important, but write it down, okay? The other thing too is if you have a bad day, let them hang around because I can guarantee you, we all think other people are looking at what we shot. Y'all don't know what other people really shot. You may know who's around you, but if you can learn to handle a bad day, then you can always learn to handle a great day. But if you only stick around when you have a great day, then what we're teaching them is to hurry up and run and try to go fix it. Sometimes we just have a bad day. So give them the support there that's really, really important. Um, you can text me or call me, that's fine, but I'll probably tell you the same thing. Y'all go eat somewhere good for dinner. And then let's talk about it later because it's just not the right time when somebody's coming off the course and they've been grinding all day their emotions are high and their willingness to listen is very low I, i'd say and for me i know what my window is my window is 20 minutes after like if i if i just had a frustrating day in the golf course where i was playing really well and i messed something up and you know it just seems like sometimes it's more or less has been happening at majors more than anywhere else lately um you know, 20 minutes, I'm a 20 minute guy. My people, they know I'm gonna be upset for 20 minutes. I'm gonna be ticked off, I'm gonna be pissed off. I'm gonna say a lot of things that I'm just saying to myself. But there comes a point where I get to get it all out and I am like, okay, give it to me. What What do we need to do swing wise? What am I, what are you seeing on the golf course? Like I'm ready and, and I'm not telling you 
the kids that tell your parents to say, hey, hang on a minute, but almost sometimes if, you're, if your parents are just say, hey, I just need a little bit more time, I'm willing to listen, I just need to get to the point where I'm ready to listen. I'm ready to listen, I'm ready to talk about golf. Um, because I'm not, I, I don't like to talk about golf off the golf course, away from the course. You know, I want, I want the one, I want to be the one to initiate that. I want to be the one to be in a place that I can initiate that. Or if, they, if it does get mentioned, then I, I'm in a place that I can, we're willing to talk about it, whether it's my game or something else on the golf course. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Any questions? Or are open books up here. So how important is it for you to uh, work the golf ball both ways on the golf course? You know, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, philosophies and, and people out there that say, you know, just hit one shot or, you know, be have the ability to work it both ways or you should work it both ways. But um, I'm a believer and you've got to have you got to have one shot that you truly believe in, whether it's a draw or a cut. Not everyone has the ability to work it both ways due to their swing, but I do think you've got to have that ability that when you do need to hit a draw, you, you, you can hit a draw. It doesn't mean you have to hit a 20 yard hooking draw, but you've got to maybe be able to work something right to left. Um, I've gone from a draw to a cut, back to a draw to now I think we're, we're, we're pretty much stuck on hitting a cut the rest of my career. Um, and I say cut the ball is going to move maybe it's going to move less than five yards. It's just going to go up and fall a little bit to the right. And I can still draw it, um, but when I need to. But I'm going based off cut, cut, cut every time. And then if, if there's just the situation or what I feel at that time says I feel more comfortable hitting a draw, I'll hit a draw. Um, TA can speak more of that because obviously he teaches kids that you know from different aspects and, and he's seen it from his side as well well i would say do you think you can get as good hitting it both ways or would you do better just hitting it one way if all you focus on is hitting it one way every time versus trying to learn to hit it two ways i think for most players having a predominantly one way shot with the occasional other shot in there if needed but I would say that I would encourage you to have one one shot that you master as opposed to try to mastering two. And I think that I do like my players, though, to practice hitting the, the let's say, Billy, we're working on pretty straight to fade, so pretty neutral swing. But I've found people, they just stand there and hit the same shot over and over again. They'll get a little biased on one side. They'll tend to get a little bit, let's say, if you're hitting a cut, you'll tend to get a little open and swing too far to the left. So sprinkle in some draws in there just to kind of keep your swing pretty balanced. I, I like a pretty balanced swing, but, you know, it's like in basketball. If I said you just shoot just with your right hand all the time versus try to get as good with your right and your left, you're going to be predominantly better with one than the other. So figure out what shot shape you like. Figure out where you like your miss to be. Master that and then learn how to make a couple adjustments in your setup to, uh, to hit the, the shot that's not your predominant shot when necessary. But... I think most guys on, on the tour, on the PGA Tour, and probably on the LPGA Tour, most, most female players have a shot that they hit and that they see, and they pretty much hit that the majority of the time unless circumstances call for them to do something different. There's only been one guy in history, uh, I can't say history, but who can hit a cut draw as equally as good as anyone has ever hit a cut or a draw in, their, in the history of the game of golf, and that's Tiger that I've seen. He's able to hit... <clears throat> You know, a 15-yard draw in one hole, or, or then a five-yard cut in the next, and and be equally as good, if not better, than anyone else who's hitting a draw or a cut. But that's just because he's so much more talented than everyone else. So. Yeah, I, I hear to that point. I hear a lot of people say, "Well, you know, Tiger, Tiger's the greatest outlier in the history of sports." I realize that, right? I mean, what's he won? What 24% of his starts? 21% of his starts? Something like that? Something I'm never going to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not. Let's not shoot too low. Well, I'm just no, saying. No, I'm just right now, maybe, maybe the next ten years I got a chance. <laughs> we just start now. But when you look at, I mean, the next greatest is under six percent. That's a tremendous outlier. So, what recognize and appreciate what he did, but don't think that that's what you have to do. Find the best version of yourself.
How do you structure the technical work before and during a tournament? Uh. That's a great question. Um, I'll give you an answer, and it's not going to make a lot of sense, and I'll let TA, you know, jump in um, because he'll put it in ways that I cannot. Uh, as I said, I'm not one that puts things down on paper, like writes goals, this, this, and that. I mean, we have, I mean, results goals. I mean, I mean, I say results, results, or I look at a results goal as like winning a golf tournament. Hey, we want to win this. We want to do this. We want, you know, we want to get a tour championship. We more or less have performance goals, things, areas in our game that we're trying to improve. And if we improve those performance goals, then hopefully the results goals sort of just fall in line and, and, and take an effect. Now, when it comes to like the technical prep and for and at a golf tournament, I mean, I, we talked about this yesterday and doing some stuff with our sponsors. I'm, I'm more or less a feel guy. I mean, I still have my technique and I still know my spots I want to want them to be in. But if I feel pretty good about where my swing is or how I'm hitting, or, or let me just say it's how it feels. And if the feel is right and the ball is doing what I want, then I'm not going to really focus too much on the technique side of it, even at a golf tournament. I'm going to more or less focus on that feel I'm having. But if that technique's off, like my, f what I'm feeling isn't actually what I'm doing in the technique side, then I'm gonna focus really hard on that technique side so my feel and my technique side match, it, match up. And then that gives me that clear mind that I need to go play. Now I'm gonna hand it over to TA and he's gonna give you a, a little better way of going about it. So I would say that we do most of our technical work prior to going to the tournament. Now we've worked together for a long time, so we kind of know what we need to do. And he's either doing it or he's not doing it. So if he's doing it, it's just about, you know, getting into his routines and working on his rhythm and his sequencing and just trying to make sure that all his pre-swing fundamentals are correct. Cause you know, you don't really lose your swing. Normally you lose something in your, that happens before you swing. So his posture is a huge thing we work on a lot. We work a lot on alignment. He tends to get aiming to the right. So. As far as the motion goes, we'll, we'll do majority of it here. The tough thing about being a swing coach is sometimes you have to make the difficult call as to how much do you do at the tournament. Um, if you see something that's a little off, you know, do you try to fix it or do you just kind of let it ride? And that's kind of my job. Billy probably doesn't want to hear that, but <clears throat> he wants to do everything perfect. But if, he, if, if I see that he's, the two things I change something is for efficiency and consistency. So if he's consistently hitting the ball solidly and it's going, in the direction we want it to go. All I'm gonna to try to get him to do is buy into it and get confidence and, and play golf. Um, but just from a progression standpoint, from an understanding standpoint, uh, my feeling is that you learn, you learn a feel from your mechanics. So like Billy said, you have some mechanical thought that produces a feel. And then from that feel, that produces a shot shape. And then you connect that shot shape to your target. So there's this progression where you, you just don't pull a feel out of the out of the blue sky. You just you have to do something to produce a feel. And if you can get to that feel standpoint, and you, when you feel A, the ball does B, and they say, okay, that's doing that. Now I just gotta start it here and it's gonna go on my target. So that's ultimately what you wanna get to is, I've worked with tour players for over 25 years and I can count on one hand the number of times that a tour player hasn't had some sort of mechanical thought or feel that they play with. The, it's it's great to say, oh, I'm just I just look at my target and I set up and it just goes there. I mean, it's great on paper, but normally um, you have something to occupy your mind, and hopefully it's something that you can connect to where you want the ball to go. Sometimes it's a rhythm, sometimes it's a, a takeaway thought, or you know, a lot of different things. Every player is a little different. I've, I've worked with some players that have to have something mechanical to keep their mind. Other players that have to be out into their target. It, it just varies. But I think what you have to find is how much can you think about and still hit the shot that you're trying to hit. And that varies from player to player. I mean, um, there's no one way of doing it. There's a lot of different ways of doing it, but that's where I think it's important for you to understand your swing and kind of what, when you're playing well, what are you thinking about? Are you a rhythm player? Are you a see a shot shape type player? Or you have to have some sort of mechanical thought to occupy your mind. Just something that, that helps you get into hitting the shot the way you want to hit it. I mean, I'm, I've always been this way, and, and like T.A. said, you know, Ben Hogan says, you know, if I have two swing thoughts, I know I play good. If I have one, I'll play, gr you know, solid, and if I have none, I play really great. That's when I win. I don't under I that my mind just can't comprehend that. I've got to have a backswing feel, 
a backswing thought and a downswing thought. Now, this is a perfect example. Earlier uh, at Northern Trust this year, I wasn't hitting it very well. And we're on the golf course and my caddy Fuchs goes, hey, hey, let's just get out there in the target. You know how we do in our chipping where, you know, we're not so much focused on, you know, the chip or what our motion is or focus on where we're trying to land it. Let's see if we can do that in out there on the golf, out up there on, when we're making a full swing where we're trying to start there, finish there, you know, just get really into out there. And I said to him, I said, Fuchs, and he's caddy for me, let's just say now for five months. Um, or at that point, four months, and I said, that doesn't work for me. I know that doesn't work for me because if I get out there and just thinking, hey, I'm gonna start at that tree and finish at that tree, I'm too much of trying to get it to do that. Um, and said, in my swing, if that's where, if those are my targets, start at that tree, finish that tree, I get, I'm like, okay, perfect. Now in my swing, I'm gonna try and feel what I need to do to hit that shot. And I'm down in, I'm down in the ball and feeling it in my swing and not trying to control hitting a five yard cut or a five yard draw. It's a feel in my swing. Now it's different in my chipping action, which we've learned is for me to hit a little cut 15 yard high mid spinner, you know, instead of me thinking about how to do it, feel it in my action. And then from there, just get so much focus into where I'm trying to land it and then let the sort of the natural ability, the, the years of hitting that shot and practicing that shot sort of just take over. And my, my, my chipping has, has improved by more or less focusing on how I'm try, where I'm trying to land it. And then that's all I'm into is that landing spot and then let everything else sort of just take over. And, and listen to the conviction of the way he describes that though. See, it's very clear and it's done for purpose. And that's what I want you to feel. Like, he'll say, this is what I'm doing. Sweet. Like, that's very clear for us on the team. It's like, he's very convicted on what he wants to do. It makes it very easy for us. And so I think that's what you got to get to. Hey, Billy, you talked about the jump that you made from junior golf to your freshman year. Um, and that was a huge uh, move up for you. What, if you were going to ballpark it, what would you say the uh, percentage was between your ears and, and your swing? I don't think it was much between my ears. Maybe there was that little bit where... I, so playing high school tournaments and maybe some tournaments in junior golf around the state of Florida, I felt confident in my ability. I only played maybe seven AJG, uh, eight or nine AJGAs and six or five of those were, you know, my my senior year of high school. I, I got played well in one and got in the Rolex and a couple other ones during some of the invitationals. Um, and maybe that gave me a little bit more confidence, but whenever I did go to maybe a bigger stage, which was very rare, um, you know, I, I wasn't sure, you know, where I stood in line, um, where the other players, uh, at that point, I mean, I'm very much a knowledge person and I understand what everyone has done. You know, even when I was in college, I go, that, that guy, he was an all American, just one blah, blah, blah. And that kid. So in college I went, it was a little bit easier cause I, w I felt like I was at being at the university of Florida. I was like, Hey, I, I've somewhat made it. I'm, I'm somebody now. Uh, obviously, the guys on my team were a lot better than me, but I think competing against, to me, competing against the players on my team and understanding I had three All-Americans on my team. Um, they had won. Did they win a national title? No, they won a national title. They had chances to win a national title, you know, a couple, you know, early in their career. And so I'm like, these guys are the top players in college. So if I can compete with them in practice, in qualifying, and beat them, then that gave me sort of that little confidence in myself that, um, I can compete with anyone on any stage. Now, jump that I made was m really, I say, is, is to learning how to play the game of golf, learning how to practice, learning how to prep, um, learning how to just, learning the true aspect of the, and I can't say the true, the, the main aspect of the game of golf, because technique side and everything's big, but if, if you don't know that when you stand up on a hole and there's water down the left-hand side of a par four and you tee up on the right-hand side and you hit a draw, you know, the right-hand side of the tee marker, like you're, you're giving yourself a narrow window to hit that fairway. Like you should be teeing up on the left-hand side of the tee box where you can aim it all the way down the right-hand side of the fairway, right edge, and you're giving yourself a bigger target to really work that draw into the fairway. So things like that, that I wasn't taught 
um, as well, just sort of was was a big key for me. Um, coming down the stretch, or maybe at the beginning of, uh, of a round, what helps you to stay present on the course mentally? You know, that's all. That's a great question, and. You know, so many answers to that question, and, and everyone's different. Listen, I, till the even to this day, you know, going on my 13th year on tour now, there's still where when I'm finishing it around, whether it's the first round, the final round, whatever it may be, where sometimes I'm more caught up in not effing up the round, and so then I, you know, so then you're protecting, and you're not really being free and, and, and allowing yourself to the golf shots and more or less when you're trying to do that you're you're gonna mess up the rounds that I seem to finish off well is and um, or the rounds I'm not really aware of what I'm shooting um, I may be aware but I know I'm playing well but I'm more or less into what am I doing right now what is this shot requiring of me how am I gonna attack it and then trying to execute the best I can and then after that it's like okay what's next did i hit it on the green that i hit it in the green side bunk okay now let's attack that shot and not so much worry about where you stand in a tournament or what your score is or man i'm two over par and i've got four left to play and i'm going to try to make two birdies yes internally you know you played enough golf you don't want to shoot over par and you know you're going to try to make some birdies so why put any more pressure why think any more about that because that's not going to help you. What's going to help you is really just trying to execute the golf shot and do it the proper way and, and focus on that shot at hand. And then hopefully you can string some good shots that allow you to make those make a couple birdies coming in to ultimately finish it even part. Um, so to me, I think the best thing you can do is really just, and it's tough. It's, it's even like I said, even now I, I still struggle with it. Um, and I'm sure everyone else on tour does and everyone else playing golf still does. No one has mastered it, um, as, as far as I know, except for maybe one guy. And that one guy is just uber talented. But it's really focusing on what you can do, control. what you. And we talked about it. What can I control? I can only control hitting this golf shot and, and doing this right now. Yes, I can control my score, my ultimate score. But how am I going to control the ultimate score is by controlling this shot here and then moving to the next shot to control that next shot and do the best I can on that shot um, and not worrying about other factors that are sort of somewhat out of your realm. Yeah, like showing up on a Thursday afternoon and there's an eight under on the board and you haven't even teed off yet. Yeah, I mean, it's not easy. And all he can do is control this little zone right here. And so what we talk about all the time is he is so good when he's got a singular purpose of what he wants to do. The rest will take care of itself. And he's so organized and he's so focused. And so what I'd recommend to you guys is when you're starting around, you're going to feel anxiety or arousal or whatever you want to say. That's normal. That's good. But have a plan for the first couple holes. You know, don't be out there saying, what do I have today? Know what you're going to have. It may not be your best, but we know we're going to get it in play. We know how we're going to move down the fairway. We're going to give ourselves some shots of birdies. But the main thing is, I'm going to own this. Just know that maybe you may be moving a little faster in the beginning, a little quicker, you know, and just walk a little slower to the first tee. Just be present where you are and just own the process that you're in. Once the ball leaves your club face, you got no control over it. None. I mean, so final round Wentworth, I played really well and warmed up really good and, you know, felt really good and hit a, you know, made a, had to make a 20 footer on number one for bogey. Um, but I, I just felt like at ease, calm. You know, I wasn't moving too quick. I wasn't doing anything too quick. I just felt comfortable. That's not always the case. And, and I would love to feel like that all the time because that's when I seem to, you know, produce better golf shots. But when I'm not in that, that calmness state, I would say I'm trying to move a little slower. Um, I'm trying to drink water slower. You know, if you see me coming down a stretch of a golf tournament, having a chance to win or make a cut or something, you know, if you see me drinking water, it's because I know I'm moving quick or I just want to slow myself down. So I'm taking a couple of nice, you know, slow sips of water, drinking some water and just having a nice, smooth, deep breath. And then obviously you guys don't have caddies, but with me and my caddy, I'm just making sure that we are going over the numbers and going through what we need, you know, what we talk about. And it's at a pace that I lock, 
like what like we're not jump you know rushing through you know the information that he's trying to give me and then we're trying to you know dissect that information to what golf shot to hit now you know we're going through it and we're we're comfortable we're taking our time and and we're having a clear picture that allows me to hopefully you know gives me the best chance of hopefully executing a golf shot so like on weeks where um you know you'd have like a different swing thought. I don't know if you ever did this, but like, did you ever find it like, do you know if you found it beneficial to like incorporate that into your pre-shot routine? Like, did you ever mess around with that? Yeah, I, I, I think, um, it's funny, I was over at the University of Florida earlier this week, talked to the team a little bit, and we talked about pre-shot routine, and I'm like, my pre-shot routine is completely different than I would say maybe a lot of guys, you know, Justin Rose is doing a lot of the same stuff in his pre-shot routine. Um, my pre-shot routine starts from when I, after I've done what I've done back here, and I'll talk about that in a second, but it starts when I start getting my target, going there, I've already know what I shot I'm trying to hit, you know, I've got a clear picture and I walk into his ball. Stuff I do before that pre-shot routine, like if Todd and I are working on, you know, let's just say this week, you know, the club's getting a little bit behind me, my left arm's a little bit too much away from me coming down, and we're trying to feel like the club arms more across or on my chest, and the club feels more out, I'm gonna really make some exaggerated feels, you know, in my pre-shot routine, that feel like that arm is on my chest and the club's more out. Um, because I'm like, because I've already known that if I do that, the ball's gonna do exactly what I want. It's gonna turn out every time, or majority of time, it's gonna, you know, you know, work the way I want or be flighted the way I want. So I will incorporate that feel into my pre-shot routine to get just to try and overdo that feel so when I'm trying to feel it in my golf swing you're never ever close to overdoing what you were ever trying to do so um you yeah I think I think it's great if you can do it walking in you know behind the ball and then once you kind of get the feel just try to carry that feel over and get into hitting your shots I agree 100 percent with that I, I think my college coach I think my buddy said this to me early on or talked about this so let's just say this is the golf ball right here there was a line drawing back here behind the ball, you know, and then whatever you did back here in sense of the feel or what you're trying to do, you know, trying to like, whether that feel that you're trying to work on in your swing or trying to feel a cut or a draw, you get that feel that you want. And then once you walk, a, you know, once you get, you know, what, what you want to do, and once you walk across that line, now you're into the shot and you're just trying to feel the shot. You're not trying to, you know, think too much, um, overly about, uh, I guess, the feel too much. You just sort of hopefully about what you did back here yeah. sort of transfers over there. Yeah, just incorporate that into your motion and know that it'll produce the shot you're trying to hit. I would probably argue too that if you do this bad back here, it's gonna be bad up there. So one of the things we work on is if you're gonna do it, do it. Yeah. Like own it. So it's like good stuff in produces good results. Garbage in produces garbage results. So own it if you do it. And, and I think that's what, it's just being present to what we were talking about before. We got time. We got time for two more. So one sec. Really quick question. In your physical routine, how much time do you spend doing cardiovascular work? None. Um, <laughs> that's my answer. Oh, well, we can tell. <laughs> Be, being in Louisiana or born there, New Orleans has some good food. Um, that's tough. I mean, I love to ride my Peloton, and that's something that I do. But does that add much to my golf game? No, it adds more of a mental thing for me. That's a mental thing. Pushing through and giving everything I can for five, 45 minutes, 30 minutes on a bike and and sort of accomplishing what i want to do on that bike before i got on that bike that's a mental thing that gives me that added mental edge on the golf course that when i can i need to make a couple birdies coming in to make a cut like i'm just gonna i'm gonna find something even deeper in me to get it done but i think cardiovascular for me when i'm working out for an hour straight or with my trainer like it's non-stop like i'm not like i go from one set to the next set to the next set to the next set like it's non-stop go, 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 go for 45 minutes to an hour. Like that's where I can get the cardiovascular aspect of it as well. I don't need to hop on a bike. Now it'd be different if I just, I did a set, sat around for a couple minutes, relaxed, got my, you know, 
you know, just, you know, calm down and then I did another set. You know, that's, that's not adding anything. But, you know, moving in and out of sets and reps and everything, that's, that's a, a workout in itself. Um, and then sort of just a, a peloton or a bike or, or sprints or something is more or less a, a mental challenge that I, that I um, sort of take on and just gives me, you know, adds strength to my mental game, you know, on the golf course. Because you know you've done it and you've invested in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, how do you prepare the tournament? That's a great question. So preparing for tournaments, every week's different. Every course is different. I'm fortunate enough, like I said, I've got a stats guy that I've been with for um, it's going to be eight years now, um, and uh, we have uh, you know we play the same courses every year. The pins are the same every year. There's not a lot of stuff that can be tricked up to us or, or new to us. So we understand how to prepare each week for a course. So how I would prepare this for a course here at TPC is different than how I would prepare for a course at Hilton Head. Hilton Head, you know, we're going to have a lot of wedges and mid irons in the greens or short irons, I mean, in the greens. So in our, in our work on the range with our track, man, we're going to really focus hard on and dialing in our numbers and making sure you know, we've got an idea of how far the ball is going at certain little factors in my swing. You know, what's full going, what's three quarters. You know, we're just going to, you know, do some games where we um, are trying to hit certain numbers that are going to be key on the golf course. Here, you know, here we're going to hit probably more mid to long irons and, and driving such a, a massive key here. And uh, maybe some chipping around the greens because of the way the greens are designed. So every week's different. And since I've and, and being prepared, but the one thing I will say is that my preparation week in and week out is exactly the same. We may change a few things up in sense of what numbers we're trying to hit or, or maybe some putting drills that we're trying to do, but it's we know at the beginning of the week, what do I need to feel? Um, when I step on the first tee, I need to feel like I've prepared, like I've checked off every box to feel like I've, I've, I'm ready to play that week and I've done everything I can to prepare that week so you know maybe if it's you know at a major it's Sunday night we figure out what we need to do Monday Tuesday Wednesday to prepare for Thursday's tea time on a regular event maybe it's Monday night we prepare we figure out what we need to do Tuesday Wednesday to feel prepared and we knock that out and then so when I step up and when I wake up Thursday morning or I get on the first tee I've done everything I know that the team and I've done everything we can to prepare that week Talk about the what you do on the hard holes, how you do short game stuff, what you do on the birdie holes. Yeah, so that's another thing. That's another aspect. Um, I'm, you know, with my stats guy, he breaks down um, the six toughest holes, the six mid range, you know, the six middle holes and the six easiest holes. So, um, perfect example here. So we break down the six easiest holes here. It's probably going to be uh, number number two. Number four, um, number six, number 12, number 16. I'm probably forgetting a hole there because that's five. 11, 11. So what we do there is take out a par five. If a par four is the easiest hole, we're not gonna hit a lot of chips around the greens. We're gonna hit putts. And we're gonna putt to the holes at where they're gonna be, but what he'll also do is he'll put a ball at 10 feet, 15 feet, 20 feet um, around the hole, and I've got to make one out of three of those because I'm going to have more like I'm going to have a birdie putt. So he's getting me prepared to try and make a birdie putt on that hole. Uh, let's say a short game hole where it's easier to understand. Um, number, let me say number five, perfect example, number five, tough hole out here in the stadium. Um, you know, greens regulation on that hole is not very high, so guys are going to miss green. So he's going to put balls at certain spots where there's going to be certain pins where if we're out of position or even if we're not out of position, if we're in position, you know, we're going to have a side we're going to favor a miss to. So if we do miss a green, then we're in a good spot to get that ball up and down. That's your that's the highest percentage spot to get the ball up and down. So we're going to go hit some chips from there, and we're going to do a little game. We'll have a little game with him where it's – Actually, not with him. It's usually with it was with Brant Snedeker when we played practice rounds together. Now it's with Sam Burns. We know we have a competition of it's three or four balls on a hole on a short game hole, 
and we're seeing who can get it closest to that to that hole that we put out on the green. And so it's just a little match play, but it's getting us into actually having to hit the chip, think about it, you know, instead of just getting over there, hit some chips and not really putting any you know, sort of pressure under, you know, in, um, you know, in practice. You're trying to, I, I think practice is so vital, whether it's on the, on the range or on the golf course, a practice round should be taken very seriously. A practice round should be taken as serious, if not more serious than a tournament, because you're preparing to play well. So you've got to prepare to, you know, for everything that could happen on that hole, um, you know, doing around the golf, whether you hit a perfect drive or whether you hit a drive in the trees or whether you hit the ball up on the green or whether you miss it in the green side bunker short side, you should be prepared to, to handle that, that thing. Um, and I'm not saying take forever in practice rounds, just, and I'm not saying hit every chip and every putt everywhere, but you can just sort of go around and look at it and say, well, this isn't a good spot. Um, let me hit one chip from here real quick, or, you know, let me hit this putt, you know, so you're just sort of preparing yourself for situations that could arise on that golf hole. Like I said, either with a golf shot or just use your mind and visualizing it. Thank you, gentlemen. That's all the time we have for today. Do we have just any closing remarks as our juniors finish up the tournament this weekend? <laughs> um, I, I can't thank you guys enough. Um, you know, my wife and I started this event five years ago, and, you know, our, our goal was to, you know, give back to juniors, give back to the AJJ. That was um, been a, huge for us to, to be where we are. Uh, and now to be where we are five years later to see the success of this event to understand that 500 kids, um, you know, registered or, or wanted to play in this event and where you can only take 78 to see that the Monday quali or the qualifier a couple days ago was completely um, sold out or booked, however you want to call it. Um, that means a lot. It means a lot to me that you guys are supporting me, but it means a lot to me that the sponsors, anyone else who are, are backing me and my wife, um, that you guys are believing in everything we're doing. And, and there's a lot of uh, people that I have to thank and, and Sherry Way and, and Morgan Reimer and Shannon Dazinski, uh, Mally Blackwater, uh, the fairway management team do an unbelievable job. Um, without them, this tournament wouldn't happen. I, 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 I'm here, you know, I, I see you guys, I do a couple events. Um, I'm aware of everything that's going on, but the behind the scenes, the day-to-day -day aspect of it, um, doesn't happen with them, with whether it's this event or anything else that I throw at them that I, I, I want to, you know, sort of help out. Um, to the AJGA staff, to Emma Madison, thank you guys so much. To, to Adam and everyone else, you guys, you know, help us tremendously in, in putting on a great event. And um, to, to TA and Joe to, to close this facility down um, at maybe a potential, you know, money making hour on a Saturday means a lot to me. And so, um, I, like I said, I, I'm thankful for everyone who, I'm thankful for you all, thankful for the parents that this event has been as successful and we're going to make it, you know, continue to be a success. So thank you guys for, for coming to play because it truly does mean a lot to me and my wife and my family and everyone else who, um, you know, who are helping put on this event every year. Yep. Anyone else here?